Please pray with me. Gracious God, may the meditations of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be an acceptable offering to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Uh, you know, this, this has got to be one of my favorite Bible stories. What's not to like? The bratty younger brother gets away with everything. Dad even throws a big party for him, using older brother's inheritance. Older brother ends up having to do the work to clean up for him and pays for it, too. No, I'm not bitter at all. Thank you. <laughs> it's hard to not read the story and think about the older brother because I have three younger siblings. I am the oldest in my family, and I'm sure that quite a few of you, the rest of you out there who are oldest siblings, when you read this story, you also think about the older brother. This, there's one of the few things that the scholars on Jesus can agree on is that Jesus used parables. And it appears that he, appears that he really loved them as well. And at the same time, we've heard them so many times that we all think we know exactly what they mean. I was doing a Google search earlier as I was working on the sermon, and I was surprised by how many people that just said, oh, this is what this all means, and they just said, it just means that. Oh, no, no, it means this. And today's parable is quite possibly the most famous of Jesus' parables, although it might be in second place to the Good Samaritan. I'm not sure. But the challenge of parables is there's a big challenge for preachers because the popularity of the parables creates these challenges for us. This is a text that we have all heard so many times. And in many ways, you probably all feel like, oh, here we go again. We've heard this story so many times. So much so that you probably feel like you could recite it by memory. So how can a preacher like myself open up this text in a new way and so you can come away thinking, oh, it's not something new. And there's a challenge in that, to breathe new life into the texts by underscoring important cultural contexts that we moderns would normally miss. And to hear the texts as the shocking stories that they would have been heard as in their context. And allowing this passage to challenge us anew in ways that a familiar story would not be able to. And at the same time remind us that we are the ones now who must respond to God's word. Now our first reading was from Joshua 5, and that continued our story from last week. Israel has come out of the wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. They have miraculously crossed the Jordan River, and now they are camped near Jericho, which they will soon engage in battle. While they were in the wilderness, God miraculously provided them with manna every day to live off of. But now, since they are now in the promised land, they are eating the produce of the land, and the manna stops falling, because now they don't need it anymore. In 2 Corinthians 5, we are reminded that those in Christ are a new creation. God has reconciled God's self with us through Christ. And now we have been entrusted with that message of reconciliation. We have been charged to be reconciled with others. And of course, Luke 15. Here, Jesus is responding to the religious leaders who were complaining that he eats with tax collectors and sinners. He answers them by telling three parables. The first one was the parable of the lost sheep. The second one was the parable of the lost coin. And the third one is the one that we actually read today. That is the parable that we normally call the prodigal son. Now I should note, and a number of commentators have mentioned this, that it's probably better to call it the parable of the loving father, since the father is actually the main character, not the quote-unquote prodigal son. 
Besides, you actually have two sons that both have issues, and I'm not like, they're not just one of them. Now, there's a lot of misconceptions about parables. There's lots of misleading or outright incorrect information that is floating out there about them. Many of us were taught to understand the parables as allegories. Now, do you remember what allegories are? No, Donna, not you. I know you do. In fact, you taught probably quite a few of these people what an allegory was. An allegory is a narrative or a visual representation in which a character, place, or event can be interpreted to represent a hidden meaning with a moral or political significance. And now that I'm reading out that loud, I'm like, wow, that really was not, it did not roll off my tongue as nicely as I thought it would. Um, Miriam Webster says it's the expression by means of symbolic fictional figures and actions of truths or generalizations about human existence. Again, that does not sound as pr profound as I thought it was going to. Basically, an allegory is a story where the elements in the story all represent something else. And usually it's trying to make a point, you know, tell a moral or, or some political point. That's usually what, what an allegory is. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence in an allegory. Each, each element has one meaning, and one meaning in, in each element. So it's a little hard to describe. Once upon a time, allegories were very popular. They're not quite as popular as they used to be. If some of you have ever read John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, that is really the classic example of an of a allegory. In fact, he, he makes it so blatant, each of the characters actually has the name of what their role is. The main character's name is Christian. He is reached by evangelists, and he is beset by all sorts of dangers, like the slew of, slew of despond and the flatterer. So, I mean, every character, everything in the story represents something else with a moral lesson being told. At this point, I imagine, or I hope, that some of that high school English is starting to come back and thinking, oh, right, that's what an allegory is. Boy, I really was trying to forget about that. And I apologize for that, but you kind of have to know <laughs> what an allegory is because most of you have been taught that's what the parables are, allegories. In fact, as I was mentioning earlier, I was surprised online how many people are convinced that there is only one right way to read these parables, and that's as allegories. In an allegorical reading of the prodigal son, uh, the prodigal son would be Gentile Christians, the older brother would be the Jews, and the father would, of course, be... Don't, don't try too hard on this. <laughs> God. God. So that would be an allegorical reading of this story. It's very neat and very tidy, but also wrong and borderline anti-Semitic. Because see, here's the problem if this were an allegory. When the son comes and asks for his inheritance, the father divides all of his possessions between his two sons. All of his possessions. Hold that in your mind. He divides all of his possessions between his two sons. The second problem with this allegory is that the prodigal son never repents. Did you notice that? He gives that carefully rehearsed speech, and when he actually has the opportunity to deliver that carefully rehearsed speech, he doesn't. His father cuts him off, and he doesn't fight to try to finish it. So I don't think that the younger brother is really repenting here. In fact, there's nothing in the younger son's actions that suggest it is anything other than his self-interest. The other problem is, I just mentioned earlier, all his property was divided between his two sons. So when he kills the fatted calf, whose fatted calf is he killing? It's not his, it's his son's. So, if this is an allegory, then the older son is actually pretty right to be upset because his father is using his property as if it's his. And that is not right. Also, you'd have to say, well, there's a lot of things about the father's relationship to his older son in addition. I mean, his brother arrives and he doesn't bother to send out a messenger. 
to say, hey, your brother's back. To let him even know about the party, he has to find out about it accidentally. And at the same time, the older brother lies to his father when he says, you didn't give me anything. Kid, your father gave you everything. That, that's not true. Because he literally gave him everything when he divided up his estate. And, in, and if, so if this is an allegory, it's probably better to call this the parable of the prodigal father because he loses one son by giving him his inheritance early, but when that come, one comes back, he alienates the other one. This is not a moral lesson in this allegory. See, that's why you don't want to see this as an allegory. One seminary professor I had always argued that parables should be seen as mirrors for reflection. Mirrors for reflection. How do we see ourselves in these characters in this story? The beauty, beautiful thing is, is if it's not an allegory, then we can see the story from different angles. We can call different lessons from it depending on the situation. Which character in, those sto in the story do you identify with? Well, sometimes you might identify with the younger brother. Other times you might identify with the older brother. Sometimes you might even identify with the father. The beautiful thing about this parable is you can identify with all of the characters in this story, whereas an allegory would limit you to really how you could see this and understand it. And there really isn't a moral in this story, per se. It is Jesus' response to the, to, the, to the Pharisees and their criticism, but this doesn't have a neat and tidy moral. In fact, there are some very shocking aspects to this story. You know, we've heard this story so many times, it doesn't really shock us anymore. But one of the things we need to remember is that Jesus was accused of eating with tax collectors and sinners. And again, we've heard that so many times, it doesn't really affect us. Because it just sounds like his critics are being self-righteous. Because we don't really have an equivalent in our day to tax collectors and sinners. Imagine if our home country was under the occupation of an oppressive empire, which sadly some people over in Ukraine identify with that very readily right now. How would you feel about the people that collaborated with that occupying repressive government? You wouldn't have fond feelings about those people, and rightly so. Because those are the people who help the occupiers maintain their control. Think about the resentment, the hatred, and even murderous rage towards those collaborators. That's what we're talking about when we talk about tax collectors. Now imagine someone simply welcomed those people into their lives. How would you feel about that? I think we can understand a little bit more about the Pharisees and religious leaders, their concerns, because you know what? We would also be a bit, not a bit, we'd be pretty offended, I think. And there's other shocking elements about this parable. You have two sons. Now, when a Jewish audience hears a story about two sons, they are automatically going to identify with, and this is the part I always misunderstood as a child, they're not going to identify with the older brother, okay? In Judaism, it's always going to be the younger brother. And Sunday school teachers, you know exactly why that is. For those of you who don't remember, God normally picks the younger brother. That is normally how the story goes. You have Ishmael, his younger brother, Isaac. You have Esau, his younger brother, Jacob. You have Manasseh, his younger brother, Ephraim. So that's what people will be expecting from this story. And of course, that is not the way the story goes. The younger brother turns out to be a total screw-up. The other shock is that the younger son asks for his inheritance now. That is a humongous insult. That is wishing that your father was dead. That is a total slap of the face. But his father, even more shocking, relents and gives him his inheritance. And then when he runs off and does whatever it is he does, 
I love how the Bible, the, the text says that he, he lived extravagantly, but the older brother has a different vision of what that is, doesn't he? Isn't that very older brother, too, to say, he lived extravagantly? No, 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 he was, he was, he was living with prostitutes. That is such an older brother thing to say, unfortunately, to take it and make it even worse. But then he comes back, and the father throws him this gigantic celebration. Again, this is a shocking and offensive thing. Yes, you accept, you welcome somebody back, right? But when you return, after doing the things they've done, you put them on bread and water. You don't feed them the fattened calf. And that's why the older brother is so offended. But the big piece of this story that I think we can bring out of this is about God's incredible love. I mean, incredible, just blow you out of the water, incredible love. Because that's the most important point in these readings. We see how in Joshua, God has blessed the Israelites with a homeland. In 2 Corinthians, we read how God has reconciled us with God. And in the gospel reading, God welcomes home the prodigal, even when they don't really repent. In fact, more so, it tells us that the father ran out to see him when he was still a long way off. That means the father was like just sitting out there waiting, looking out the window, waiting for him, day after day after day, waiting for him to come. And finally he that says something about the incredible love of God. But where does that leave us in all this? I mean, after all, this kind of leaves us with a nice warm, fuzzy feeling, right? Knowing that God has moved heaven and earth for us. And I think of quite a few people in their spirituality, that's kind of where they stay. But that isn't really the point of the story. Because we really need to ask ourselves, well, what do we do now? See, God doesn't intend for us to continue as mere passive recipients of God's goodness. As Paul tells us, we are to be inspired by that message and to take on God's work ourselves. This parable of the loving father is a slice of life. It cuts off right in the middle of the action. I love how, the story, how Jesus does that. It doesn't give us a resolution because we don't know what happens next. Does the older brother relent and go into the party? We don't know. It cut off before he, that happens. Does the tr younger brother ever truly repent? Or does he go right back to his old ways now that he's no longer in danger of starving to death? Again, we don't know that. We are left to figure it out. That's one of the things that Jesus does in his parables. He leaves it kind of on an open end so that his audience kind of has to think about, well, how does that story end? We know from the gospel that Jesus gave the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the prodigal son because the religious leaders were grumbling about his eating with sinners and tax collectors. And these stories tell us something about God's amazingly generous love and unmerited goodness. The parable of the lost sheep tells us about how a shepherd leaves his 99 sheep behind to go find the one lost sheep. That's something about this generous and unmerited goodness. And it's a call to us to be more inviting, to be more loving, to be forgiving. So what can we do? Well, first off, we probably shouldn't be the older brother. <laughs> you see, God is generous even to people that we think don't deserve it. But that's a reminder, too, that we might not be quite as deserving as we think we are. I've noticed that a lot of people tend to think they deserve the good things that happen to them, and likewise, everybody else deserves the bad things that happen to them. I found out that there were 
become self-serving sometimes in our thinking. We probably need to recognize that we don't necessarily deserve what we get from God either. And the lesson for us is, you know, I mean, I don't know how many times I've heard people when talking about, say, politics or something like that, they'll say, those people don't deserve help. Well, who gets to decide who deserves? Who, who really deserves? That's, that's a question we need to be honest with ourselves. Do we really deserve? So we shouldn't be the older brother. We should be willing to change. Now, the younger brother may not have actually repented. Like I said, pretty much everything he does you know, oozes self-interest, right? Just like the, you know, the batting eyelashes, Daddy, please do this for me. You know, it it kind of has that feel to it. But at the same time, the younger brother understood that he was at a dead end. And sometimes that's the only way that we know it's time to change. When we've reached a brick wall with nowhere else to go. Kind of reminds me of something Winston Churchill once said. The United States can always be counted on to do the right thing after all other options have been tried. Sometimes we are like that too. But when we're stuck, we need to know it's time to change. And we can look to the Father in this story. This Father's great love that shows through everything. Yes, sometimes it's naive. Sometimes it's over the top. But it's always loving. And we can take that as a model for us. Sometimes we're going to do things that seem naive or over the top, but need to be loving. And don't worry about what your kids or your neighbors think. Be generous, because God's world is full of plenty. There's no need to be stingy. Donate more money to the church, or donate to relief for Ukraine. Give a bit more of your time helping others. Reflect that overflowing love of God wherever you are. You know, like I said, the parable of the good of the prodigal son is not one of my favorites. I always read it, and I always think, gosh, that little brat. But... That's probably why I need to read the story, because it reminds me that I'm probably not as deserving as I think I am. And every, every, every younger brother has an older brother who's also got his issues. At the end of the story, both brothers have a challenging relationship with their father. Both of them are in a state of estrangement. We all have our own sins, our own weaknesses, our own flaws that cause problems and that might render us not deserving. But if we concentrate on the goodness and love of God that always prevails, we can be grateful and in turn respond with our own gracious love.